So Jeannie, we've talked about it on our podcast, and I know through AppSets they see this this long view of recovery that we talk about that particularly the marriage relationship, this could be a three to five year process of getting to a place of real lasting stability and change and and feeling like, man, we're a transformed couple. Uh, For some people, that sounds like an eternity, especially if they're maybe early in recovery, they're listening to this podcast because there was just discovery in their relationship. Uh, Talk a little bit about that. Like, why does this take so long? And what do you say to someone that's early in recovery feeling like that's an eternity to walk in in recovery? Yeah, I totally get it. I mean, to be on the front side and say, well, this is going to take three to five years. (sighs) Just the the fear of that and the the sense of hopelessness that can come up at those early stages. So why does that happen? How does that happen? How can you perhaps make it less time? The piece is about getting, again, getting trained, getting trained support, getting in with services, resources that understand your world, getting both of you into some kind of, of care and discussion. Um, I find that folks work through that quicker, faster. I don't know if that's the right words, but, um, if they can be well resourced, which means they have people, places, things, faith that are strengths for them that they can call upon in, in their hard times. So that definitely helps betray partners with healing. But also those who are struggling, you know, really get into sobriety and recovery. There's so many pieces and factors to that. There's also the pieces of finances. You know, money really impacts sometimes what kind of services folks can get. Yeah. The sooner you can get into services. And I'll also say, um, you know, betrayed partners, I want them to heal whether their loved one is doing the work or not. But I'll tell you, it is, um, I don't know, I don't want to say easier because none of this is easy. Um, But when your loved one who's struggling with the sexual behavior really commits, surrenders, really dives in. So it's not that they're going to their clinician or their coach 50 minutes once a week. That's not going to do it. I mean, we have to remember that this compulsive behavior or addiction is a really a neurological thing. So you've really got to do the the muscle memory body work every day, every day, every day to create these neuro, neural pathways. So the loved one, the betrayer, when they really commit and dive in and they're doing something which doesn't have to be a meeting every day, but could be journaling, prayer, homework, counseling, they really commit that really speeds up their work. And then betrayed partner tends to see that behavior and feel a bit safer, Mm -hmm. emotionally, physically, sexually safer. So that then also helps the betrayed partner as they're doing their healing work. It kind of becomes double time because if they have a safe environment to do that work in, it kind of speeds up their road to, to healing as well. Yeah. Now, the question I asked, Nick, is did I answer your question or did I just go on to something else? <laughs> That's really good. No, I, I think it speaks about the there there is a f- there are phases of healing. And I know if someone takes the AppSets training, they would see some of this model and those different pieces. It makes me think about some of the similar things we might experience in physical therapy. You know, a couple of years ago, I tore while out running, I tore my plantar fascia, the very bottom of your foot. Mm-hmm. And that was incredibly painful. And, you know, a doctor and the, you know, physical therapist said it was going to be about a six month process, which as a runner, like, I don't like to take two days off, let alone think it might be six months to be running again. And, but that doesn't mean that I was in six months of constant pain and then hit a day and got better and started running, right? There were phases. There was a couple of weeks that anytime I put pressure on that foot, I was in pain and I knew it. And so I'm in a walking boot. Well, the pain started to go away, but that didn't mean I just you know, oh, I'm, I'm in no pain. Now I go run. No, then I was still in a walking boot just with some discomfort. And then I was able to take off the walking boot and learn to walk without it. And there was still discomfort, but I could manage it. And then I reached a point, the discomfort was better and all the training, uh, you know, physical therapy stuff I'd been doing, like, okay, try to run a mile. And I ran a mile and it wasn't super comfortable, but I, I was able to run. And over 
two, three more months, I ramped up my running until about six months down the road, I was actually running better and healthier than I had before. And I think in recovery, if we think about re our relationship, and again, it does require a spouse who's also committed to the process, but if they are, there are going to be these, these phases where you're not going to be in you know, constant pain for three years and then run full speed. There might be a season where the pain is intense, but as it subsides, then there's discomfort, there's learning new rhythms, then there's growing in some of that trust and those new, those new normals. And, and all this as a, f a phased approach can it be helpful. Like, and so I've, I just think it's encouraging to tell a couple, yeah, the full process may be years, but a few months in, if you're both really leaning in and doing your work, you may begin to have hopefulness much, much sooner than that. You might start to see some new things much sooner. What we're trying to encourage is that doesn't mean then you quit and just believe it's all going to be okay. You continue in the process until that new normal has solidified and become even better than what you had before.